Hey everyone, Wolflore here. Today we discuss the return of Vulcan to the throne world and his face to face meeting with the High Lords of Terror. Spoiler warning to begin, as the events we're discussing today are from the Warhammer 40k novel The Beast Must Die by author Gav Fulp. As always, I really recommend you read the stories for yourself first without spoilers as that's the best way to enjoy the lore for yourself. But with that said, let's just jump straight in. Now, during our last conversation, we discussed the Imperium finding Vulcan during the War of the Beast. Over 8,000 years before Gilliman would return to the Imperium, Vulcan would perform exactly the same feat. Reluctantly returning to aid the Imperium, in its moment of need, as it reeled from the galactic-wide assault of the Orcs, all transpiring during the Beast Arises saga, in particular the novel The Hunt for Vulcan. And I say reluctant return, as it was fairly clear Vulcan had a certain degree of disappointment that the Imperium was in the state it was, that it needed to seek him out in the first place, for Vulcan knew that this was not the war he was supposed to return for. However, after ensuring Caldera's safety, the world in which Vulcan was on, he would do exactly what his brother Rebute would do upon his later return to the galaxy, and head to the throne world. Now, while Gilliman returned in a time of confusion, to see if the throne world still stood, to see even if his father still lived, Vulcan returned specifically to head a crusade. An assembly of select first founding chapters and the Imperial Fist assembled last wall would crusade to Ulanor to face down and defeat the Orc Empire once again. Her Primarch was quite simply the only figure capable of wielding such a force, and holding its loyalty without question. And so it was, Vulcan returned to the Imperium and Terra, and the similarities between the Primarch returns would continue, as both Primarchs would be disgusted by the running of their father's empire by the High Lords of Terra or perhaps lack of running may be a better description. However, while Gilliman returned to retake rule, and thus promptly removed many High Lords from power, even later having to suppress an attempted rebellion by them, Vulcan primarily cared only about the Imperium's immediate safety, and thus he didn't follow the same route as Rebute. However, he made it clear upon his arrival how appalled he was by the High Lord's performance. I have spent a day and a night in contemplation of the words and deeds of the High Lords, Vulcan continued. You should give thanks for the Orcs and for the threat they represent. He spoke calmly and with infinite disgust. If not for the need for unity, I would kill you all myself. And I find it really interesting how easily the Primarchs just assume authority. Of course it's not a surprise, they're Primarchs, son of the Emperor himself, demigods. I'd let them do what they want as well. But technically, what kind of role do they actually have? Commanders of chapters after the scouring. The power should really lie with the High Lords, the Lord Commander, no matter how bad they may be. Yet Vulcan here is in no doubt he can command the Imperium if he so wishes, be judge and jury of the High Lords themselves. And Gilliman of course simply appointed himself as Lord Commander and Imperial Regent when he later returned as well. It'll be interesting to see how the Primarchs react and behave when we get into the Scouring series, 
with Gilliman as Lord Commander, and then of course after their legions are broken. With no Emperor, no Malkador. It's just hard to imagine at this point. And I really think this is key with the Primarchs as well. That they have to command. It's in their very genetic makeup. Their reason for being. If there's not a Primarch in command as Lord Commander, or their father, they just seem to have that instinctual desire to assume authority. Though Vulcan doesn't hear, he makes it clear he can and could if he wanted to. Now, after Vulcan's initial scolding of the High Lords of Terror upon his arrival, there would be an official convening of the High Lords to plan the crusade against Ulanor. And this was within the novel The Beast Must Die by author Gav Thorpe. Here, as Vulcan enters the chamber, flanked by the Astartes commanders, there is no better representation and contrast of what the Imperium was, its golden age of crusade, and what it had become. Stagnated and ruled by the corrupt. Space Marines, each dwarfed the chapel's occupants, just the seven present were capable of killing everyone within, including the Lucifer Blacks. Except Van Gorek, of course. At any given heartbeat, he knew precisely which of the four escape routes he might use, should the Adeptus Astartes decide that pandering to the pride and ambition of these mortals was too much effort. Captain Valefor of the Blood Angels, Wolflord Asger of the Space Wolves, Chapter Master Odanathus of the Ultramarines, and Grand Master Seychel of the Dark Angels, both newly arrived on Terra, fresh from battles in the darkest reaches of the galaxy. Their chapters bore the names of the greatest legions from the Heresy War, and carried that distinction well. With them came High Marshal Bohemond of the Black Templars, and Chapter Master Quisadra of the Crimson Fists. Both had earned glory in the battles against the Orcs thus far, each creating a legacy worthy of Rogal Dawn, from whom their gene seed had been created. Others were continuing the fight in the Soul System and beyond. And with these Lords of the Space Marines arrived the last of Dawn's sons, the remaining survivor of the Imperial Fists. Captain, Chapter Master, and lately, Lord Commander Corland, who had resumed the use of his war name, Slaughter. His ochre plate had recently been repaired and repainted, but the injury of war and loss was born in his eyes. Dark, distant, they looked upon the High Lords as those surveying pieces of furniture a necessary but uninteresting feature of the environment. And then came Vulcan, and suddenly the mighty halls, kilometres long processionals and cavernous chapel did not seem so large after all. The Primarch filled the huge space, and not just with his gigantic physique. The raw presence of the Emperor's warlord was like a force that swept all before it. A few of the High Lords stood up on reflex. Some bowed, and all but Van Gorik averted their gaze. However briefly. In another time, this could very easily have been the Imperium's golden age. Space Marine captains across the bloodlines. Space Wolves, Ultramarines, Blood Angels, Dark Angels the Imperial Fists, and a Primarch, resplendent in his glory, his greatness undeniable, a true son of the Emperor himself, marching through the very halls of the Imperial Palace. And yet, the one small detail, small clue, that this isn't the Golden Age. And all but Van Gorik averted their gaze. However briefly, 
Van Gorik is the master of the Assassinorum, the only High Lord who is actually loyal to the Imperium first, who had been doing everything he could to force the High Lord's hands, to make them act, to save the Imperium. So he has no shame, nothing to hide. He can look upon the Primarch as he should, marvel at his glory. But all the others averting their gaze, all of them, unable to look upon Vulcan as he enters, just the small, truest revelation of their inner guilt. Can you imagine a time in the Great Crusade of this scene transpiring, of the Lords of Terror being unable to look upon Vulcan? It just wouldn't happen. He would be welcomed and honoured as the son of the Emperor he is, and the Lords would have nothing within them that would have them instinctually looking elsewhere. And so that one action, something so simple, reveals everything wrong at the heart of the Imperium, at the heart of its rule. And on an unrelated topic here, I find it quite curious that Vulcan never went to the throne room, never went to see his father upon the Golden Throne. Now, yes, he could have, and it simply wasn't stated that he did so, which is very possible. However, considering we never see it, you'd have to assume he didn't, and I am a little curious as to why especially considering Vulcan has always had a close relationship with his father. Never a question at all that Vulcan would remain loyal. But I guess here, there's no question the Emperor still lives upon the throne. Again, it's only 1500 years after the heresy. So Vulcan maybe can just focus on the matter at hand. However, regardless of that, the meeting with the High Lords would continue, with Vulcan casting his gaze over the assembled group and the room. And there's a great little moment where Vulcan meets Van Gorik's eye, making even the Master of Assassins flinch a little. And Van Gorik realises in that moment, as half a smile flickers across Vulcan's face, that Vulcan knows all too well that the officio has a procedure, or plan in place, to eliminate a Primarch if they have to. And the smile is almost a challenge to try. Vulcan's view or opinion on the notion. A small moment, but one I enjoyed. But then, Vulcan would ask the Grand Master the purpose for the Crusade to Eulenor. You ask me because I am the assassin, Lord Primarch, which gives us our answer. The Grand Master replied smoothly, moving into the light, drawn forth like venom from a bite. To slay the great beast, we know that orcs follow the strongest leader. Take that away, and they will fall on each other in the resulting power vacuum. The invasion will splinter and die. For all their barbaric strength, they are vulnerable to a classic decapitation strike. Had we known that Eulenor was the source, I would have directed efforts thus, protested Lansung. He wilted a little as Vulcan's unforgiving gaze moved to him, but retained enough composure to redirect the Primarch's ire. Had the Fabricator General not withheld such intelligence, we might have ended this sooner. Even across the medium of the hololithic transmitter, Cubic looked unsettled. Vulcan said nothing, but moved to one end of the debating table, as his commanders spread to either side. Van Gorik tried not to think of it as an encircling manoeuvre but he quickly reassessed his options and concluded that only two escape routes remained. The full weight of Mars is being directed to support the assault of the Lord Primarch. Cubic's voice buzzed from a Voxcaster placed in front of his hazy image. 
as swiftly as it can be mustered. Dominus Gerg Zukov is one of our best and most experienced commanders from the Tegmata. One of your best, said Vulcan. The best, Kubik answered quickly. His Logistaria and strategic engrams date back to the Heresy War and earlier. The ships are ready, Vulcan demanded of Lansung. The High Lord Admiral nodded without comment. I have put out the call for the Frateris to assemble. Thousands of followers are ready to embark as soon. Mesring trailed off in the face of Vulcan's unflinching stare. That will not be necessary, Ecclesiarch. The Primarch's distaste for Mesring's position made the title sound like a curse. Your brand of zealotry will not serve our cause. Even here in this brief encounter, you can see the High Lords already doing what they do best. Vying for power. Focusing on that self-interest. Here it's just by trying to suck up to the Primarch. Lansung, head of the Navy. Quick to throw the Fabricator General under the bus. As reason why he hasn't assembled the fleet already. Not already taken out the Orc homeworld. The Fabricator General, in fearing Vulcan's judgement, has fled to Mars, not attending the meeting in person, stammering over the one of your best remarks. And then the Ecclesiarch, offering his followers without even being asked by the Primarch. Considering the Imperium's in the state it is here, because the High Lords didn't and wouldn't act, You'd have to say this is quite a miraculous change. Again, just showing how motivated by their own self-preservation they actually are. Let's be honest here, none of them, none of them, are doing this for the good of the Imperium. They are doing it because they fear Vulcan's wrath, if they don't. And you get the clear sign here of Vulcan's distaste for the now powerful Ecclesiarchy. The worship of his father that now dominates the Imperium across the galaxy. He's not overly vocal about it, doesn't chastise it or make claims to remove it, but that distaste is evident. However, it's then that the Master of the Administratum, quite clearly unhappy at his position, being ignored, and his organisation used, without his explicit consent, speaks up. I, that is my organisation, he sniffed, gripped his reports tighter and started again. The words burst forth in a breathless stream, this whole process is without mandate or proper protocols and is not in compliance with at least 72% of the Senatorum Imperialis Code, not least being the exclusion of required officials to make proper record and deliver due notification on the deliberations and ramifications of gatherings at which Imperial policy and the application of military resource of greater than regiment strength or equivalent thereof has been debated. I am quite sure that half of those words were not in the correct order, said Odenaphus. Are you objecting to something? This war, Eckhart blurted, is illegal, without proper authority, of uncertain integrity. The next word was uttered with such contempt that it made Van Gorick wince unauthorized. You mentioned compliance, said Vulcan, folding his arms. That word can mean many things. In one respect, it is something with which I am more familiar than any other in this chamber. I don't understand, confessed Eckhoff, looking to his companion High Lords for support or guidance. Van Gorick laughed gently, and he felt their scrutiny and their antipathy. The master of the administratum glared at him. What is so funny, Eckhart demanded. You seek compliance, my dear Tobris. Van Gorick looked across to Vulcan. 
worlds brought into the Imperial Truth during the Great Crusade were compliant. The Lord Primarch has several thousand Space Marines poised at his command, in orbit and on the surface of Terra. It is we that need to consider the nature of compliance. Silence followed for several seconds. Vulcan did not gainsay Vangoric's assertion. Good, the Primarch nodded. We are of one mind. Let us turn our efforts to Eulenor and the matter at hand. Let's just consider the absurdity of this situation for a moment. The entire galaxy is feeling the full wrath of the Orcs. The Imperium is struggling from one fringe of the galaxy to the other. The throne world itself has had Orcs upon its surface. And this High Lord, angry because his authority is being usurped in a way, no doubt egged on behind the scenes by his fellow council members, dares to claim it's an unauthorized war. Illegal. The throne world itself has had an orc battle moon above it, and he calls this an illegal war, because the High Lords of Terra haven't authorized it. I mean, if that doesn't encapsulate the entirety of the High Lord's patheticness, I don't know what does. Vulcan has literally had to be searched for and found on the other side of the galaxy, begged and pleaded to return to help save the Imperium from destruction. And even then, he still has to put up with someone claiming his actions are not authorized illegal. Oh, how Malkador and the Emperor would despair. How far the dream has fallen. How better the Imperium might have been had Vulcan indeed killed all the High Lords as they deserved. Vangoric aside, of course. But what a counter. Vulcan not even having to say anything, other than subtly reminding the room just who they are speaking to. How he of all people understands compliance. Who conquered a galaxy at the head of a legion. Under the mantra of that very word. And Van Gorik's absolutely right. It's not Vulcan that needs to comply. It's them. The High Lords of Terra. Or the throne world itself would become the latest world conquered by a Primarch, at the head of a legion. In many ways, they are incredibly lucky it was Vulcan of all the Primarchs who returned here, and not another of the brothers, because I certainly can't see, say, Rogel sparing them for bringing the Imperium to its knees, for having the throne world itself threatened, the Emperor. Honestly, even the patience of Sanguinius would have been tested here. And despite chiding them, warning them of their failure, still he has to put up with this kind of resistance. It's just incredulous, really. However, so it was that the crusade to Eulenor was formed, thanks to the return of Vulcan to the throne world and the High Lords having to be terrified threatened into line, into performing the role they should have been doing all along. But as always everyone, what do you think? Were the High Lords lucky it was Vulcan that returned here, and not another brother? Was in fact Vulcan the best Primarch to return for this moment? That perhaps sparing the High Lords in this moment of strife was in fact the right move? Or perhaps would the Imperium have been better off if he cleared house, started over? What if Gilliman returned here instead of 8,000 years later? Could the dark future of the Imperium have still been averted by Gilliman reassuming the Lord Commander role? And do you think Vulcan would have forcefully removed the High Lords if he had to? Use those forces of the Astartes to eradicate them from terror? and the Imperial Palace? Or was it more a threat 
that he wouldn't have followed up on. As always, leave your thoughts in the comments below. Huge thank you to all my subscribers, your support truly means a lot to me, it really does. If you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too. But with that said, I am off, and I'll see you all again real soon.